Fathers are a very special thing. I remember the day when I would throw my son, uh, both of them, up into the air like that. Now, if I did, I would be crushed. So uh, they do grow, and uh, praise God for that. But uh, what memories. A father throws uh, the children higher than his head until they are weak from laughter. He casts a deciding vote on the puppy debate. He listens more than he talks. He lets them make mistakes. He allows them to fall from their first two-wheeler without having a heart attack. He reads a newspaper while they're trying to parallel park for the first time in preparation of a driving test. If I had to tell you someone's, uh, someone's son what a father really does that is important, it would be that he shows up for the job in good times and bad. That he's a man who is constantly being observed by his children. They learn from how he handles adversity, anger, disappointment, and success. He will laugh at their dreams, no matter how impossible they might seem. He will dig out at 1 a.m. when one of his children runs out of gas. He will make unpopular decisions and stand by them. When he's wrong, he makes it right with his children and his family. He leads them to church and teaches them about a loving Heavenly Father and trains them up in the Word of God. I am very thankful for our fathers today. The passage that we're going to be in is a continuation of our study of the person of David. It just so happens that God has placed this passage in 22 in front of us where we get a very clear contrast between two types of fathers. I know in a church like this that many of the fathers we have are like the father of David, of Jesse. But I want to challenge you with this message today so that as you go out into the world, you're equipped with an understanding of what a biblical father looks like. The contrasting father was a person of Saul. Uh, King Saul was a leader of a nation, but not a leader of his own home. It was his own son, following God's commands, by the way, who partnered with David in a covenant relationship to honor God and to protect him. And this passage sees a continuation of the unraveling of one father and his family while the other is blessed and continues to be blessed. And my challenge for us today, men, is that we would hear the call. We'd answer that call. What kind of father are we? And that's where we'll be today. So stand with me as we read uh, chapter 22, 1 Samuel, chapter 22. We're going to be studying the entire chapter, but I'm going to read with you now the first eight verses. Verse 22, or chapter 22, verse 1 says, So David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adelon. And when his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, they went down there to him. Everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him, and he became captain over them all. Now there were about 400 men with him. And David went from there to Mizpah and to Moab. And he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and my mother come and stay with you until I know what God will do for me. Then he left them with the king of Moab. And they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. The prophet Gad said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. David departed and went into the forest of Horeb. And then Saul heard that David the men and the men who were with him had been discovered. And now Saul was sitting in Gibeah under the Tarmus tree, and the height with his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing around him. Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Here now, O Benjamites, will the son of Jesse also give to all of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? For all of you have conspired against me so that there is no one who discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. And there is none of you who is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in ambush as it is this day. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would guide us and direct us, Lord, to move us to where you would have us to be. But Fathers, I thank you, Lord. Or Lord, I thank you today for those fathers uh, in our congregation that have uh, done just as the video showed and, and as the illustration showed, Lord, raised their children and are raising their children, Lord, lifting them up and, 
and encourage them, training them in your ways. But I pray for those who are here today, if there's one of us that, that is uh, in need of an area of improvement in our life and our fatherhood, Lord, open our eyes to it, open our hearts to it, that we would hear your message, that we would understand that your, your reproof and your correction is for us. It is for us to become better fathers. Lord, help me in my own parenthood to be a better father each day. God, I pray that you would guide us in this passage to understand the heart of your message. To take from these two examples a message and a lesson home with us that would transform who we are. Father, hide me behind the cross that they would hear a word I say. But that, Lord, we today would hear from you your message. For all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I do want to make mention very quickly and briefly with you to continue to pray for Hazel uh, Williamson. I just want to uh, ask you to be in prayer for her. She fell, uh, I believe it was Thursday. Was that right, Thursday? And broke uh, the femur bone right below her hip. Um, Hazel is one of the strongest, toughest ladies I've ever met. And so already today she's in the process of sitting up and the doctors are so excited about her. She just had surgery yesterday. They're so excited about her, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, her comeback, if you will, uh, that, that they're talking about letting her walk this afternoon. Um, so just be praying for her. Uh, God has brought her a long way and she would like her church to be praying. I know many of you have been. But I wanted our whole church to know, uh, to be praying for her uh, during this time. It was exciting for me. I'll, I'll mention this because David's not here, uh, but you can tell him. When I see a good example, I want to do so. We were in the uh, emergency room yesterday waiting on her surgery to be completed. And uh, someone said, let's, let's go have lunch. And it's going to be another hour before she's out of surgery. He said... I'm not going anywhere until my mom was okay. That was cool. Good son, right? But what was really cool was what happened next. They turned to both of David's kids and, and they said, we, we stay with our dad. We stay with our dad. And I thought to myself, I'm seeing a picture of what God's been teaching me all week about fathers and that, the, the honoring of the father who has taught them right and led them right. Now, I just pray today that as we have studied this passage, that we'll understand God's plan for us. That we'll understand God's call to men to be fathers. There's another illustration, not so fun, maybe a funny story, but not so fun when we think about it for a second. I'm going to share it with you. It's told by Ernest Hemingway. It says a father of a teenage son who had a relationship that had become strained to the point of breaking. Finally, the son ran away from his home, and his father, Howard, began a journey in search of his rebellious son. Finally, in Madrid, in a last desperate effort to find him, the father put an ad in the newspaper. The ad read, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the newspaper office at noon. All is forgiven, and I love you, your father. The next day at noon, 800 Pacos showed up. <laughs> That's funny. But it's also sad. More than ever before, I believe, in our society, there is a need for fathers and men to step up. Do you know that in, in, our, um, in our society, a study was done at Abilene Christian University. The study said that in the homes where fathers were the spiritual leader of the home, meaning they took their children to church and they led them in a godly way and they trained them. They mean they were perfect. Let me just say that. But in those homes where the father did those things, 100% of the time, the children showed more spiritual maturity than their peers whose fathers were not doing those things. And so I want to challenge you with this. This study was done in six different test areas of our country. When they do a test, they must at least do 5,000 families, 5,000 persons to make it legal. So that's 30,000 people picked out randomly of a crowd. Those stats are overwhelming. 100% of the time, when a father is a spiritual leader, the children show spiritual maturity. 
We see this in this passage I just read to you. Let me, let me share with you some things I see. I only have two points today, uh, which should uh, excite you. But uh, just two points. And the first one is that fatherhood of God is the key to effective fatherhood. Fellowship of God is the key to effective fatherhood. Now let's think about Jesse for a minute. Jesse, the father of David. What, was he not a follower of God? When Samuel came to the town where uh, Jesse lived, or to the land where Jesse lived, Samuel said, God has given me a call that says that someone in your family is going to be the next king, the successor of Saul. What was Jesse's immediate response? It was to pull his oldest sons, his six oldest sons, into the room so that Samuel could meet them and determine which was God's chosen son. So he was obedient to God. He was obedient to God's man. He was obedient to everything that God would have. And he was willing to give up his family, willing to put them out there for God's purpose. What happens is that those six older brothers, they don't make the mark. They're not the one that God had planned. So he sends for his son David in the field, tending sheep, to come and to be in front of Samuel. So it shows me that a father doesn't quit no matter how hard it is. He's willing to give up whatever it takes and willing to do whatever it takes for God's plan to come about. So David is anointed to be the next king. You know that story we studied. In this section though, if you remember leading up to this time, David's been hiding. Just last week we found him in a town called Nob uh, on a hill at a temple begging for bread for him and his few men. The reason why was because King Saul was conspiring to kill him. <coughs> Things have not changed. The, the conspiring is still happening, and he's left now, and he, he's gone back to this cave. In this cave, uh, Abdullah was a hideout for him and his men, but it wasn't really safe. It was on the border of the land of Judah. Now, David came from the tribe of Judah. Saul came from the tribe of Benjamin. That's only important because you see Saul trying to stir up his tribe against God and against Judah uh, as his kingship is falling apart. But, but David uh, hears a call from a prophet who, who told, tell, God tells the prophet, you tell David this, and David's told, move them out of the cave. So he leaves the cave and he goes to a, an area called Horeb, a forest nearby, and that becomes the stronghold of David and his men. But what is interesting to me is what happens. So here we have David. He's hiding in a cave. The, the king is trying to conspire to kill him and trying to kill him in many different ways. And his father hears about the trouble that David is having. And what does the Bible say that David's reaction is? Or I mean that Jesse's reaction is. Look again at verse 1. It says, David departed from there and, and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So we see him in the cave. And when his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, what did they do? They went down. Now some have said that one of the reasons why they went down was because Saul, or I mean Jesse and his family were fearful of the reprisals of Saul as well. But to that point, when this is written, there's not been reprisals. It's been David that has been the main target. There will be reprisals, and they come beginning in this passage. But I believe that Jesse, being David's father and loving his son, immediately responded because where his son was in trouble, he wanted to be there with him. And I see a very clear thing that Jesse raised his son to honor God and to serve him when called upon. David, due to the teaching of his father, wrote this in 1 Chronicles 29, 17. He said, Since I know, O oh my God, that you try the heart and delight in uprightness, I in the integrity of my heart have willingly offered all of these things. So now with joy I have seen your people who are present here make their offerings willing to you. David understood because of the teaching of Jesse all his life to honor God. Remember what he did when he came across the giant? Saul was afraid to fight the giant. The entire Israelite army was not going into battle because the giant alone was so fearful. 
And so David says, the Lord will give me victory. And he goes. And when he chastised the giant, he said, it is because my God is with me that you will die. And what happens is that David wins the victory. But let me tell you today, it's not because of what David or Jesse did. It's not because <coughs> Jesse taught David to be a good hunter. It's not because Jesse taught David to be a good fighter that the battle was won that day. It was because Jesse, the father, had taught his son to be a good follower of God. And so when David found himself in the greatest mess, he turned toward the teaching of his father, the God of his father. And the result was clear. Well, here we see that Jesse's work was never done. Fathers, is our work ever done? Let me ask some of my, my more senior fathers, is our work ever done? We pray for them long after we finish supporting them. We, we love them. We encourage them. <clears throat> I remember as a young child, my father, and all the important things that he did for me. I remember that first time I got in a bike accident. He had told me a hundred thousand times not to ride my bike down that hill. The hill where all the big boys rode their bikes. But I'm telling you, he didn't know how cool I was at that age. I was cool enough to hang with them big boys, and sure enough, I went down. And when I woke up in the hospital with that knot on the side of my head and teeth busted out the mouth, my father was laying on the bench outside that room and had been for days. I remember the first time I got my heart broke. I remember coming home and sitting on that couch in the middle of that dark room. And I remember as my father came downstairs, put his arm around me and said, Son, it will be okay. I remember that. I remember those times when, when I was uh, getting ready to come home from the service. I remember the time of going to the service. I had to take my car to St. Louis and put it on a boat. So they drive it over there to Germany. Ruth, you remember this? My dad said, I'll take you. So he got in his truck and he followed me all the way to St. Louis before we went in just to make sure my car got on the ship. I remember the times when I came home. I remember those times up until this very day when he's called me and said, son, that sermon was this or this. I want to encourage you with this. Do this for your family. And I think to myself, anything good in me has come from the teaching of my father and the love of my Lord. And I wonder today if that's not what Jesse was thinking when his son was in trouble. Wait a minute, this king, this Saul, wants to kill my boy? I'm going down there. I'm taking my whole household. The Bible says that when they were all gathered down in the woods, that the number was over 400 men. That probably means there were maybe a thousand people. Because when they took censuses of battle situations, the men were the ones that counted, but the women and children would have been there as well. Now let's contrast this with the person we read about, Saul. Saul was also a father of Jonathan, David's confidant and best friend, the protector of David, in fact. Saul had been running from God. He started uh, good enough in his early ministry, trusting in the Lord, recognizing that he was not fit to be king. If you remember way back, he was hiding in the baggage when God used Samuel to call him out to the people. They had to get him out of the baggage. He was hiding because he was fearful of being king. Fast forward to this passage and we see a man desperately fighting to stay king. Desperately fighting with all his power to try to be king, even at the demise of his own family. Take, for instance, Saul's situations in his life where instead of teaching his son about God, he tried to kill the man of God. He threw a spear at the body of David while David played a harp for him. Even in this passage, David is still fighting the battle for Israel. Do you notice that David has come off of the fight against the Philistines and he hears that the king, his own king, is still trying to kill him? Where Jesse was willing to put everything at risk for his son. Where the father was willing to put everything at risk for his son. Saul 
was willing to put his son at risk for everything. And I tell you today, men, that is not who we've been called to be. We've not been called to be Saul's, to build our little empires, to hold on to our little kingdoms. We've been called to be fathers to our children, husbands to our wives. We have been called to be leaders in the church, and we have got to step out. More so than ever before, the men are absent in the church. And men, I know I'm preaching to the few choir, but we've got to get the message out there that God needs the men of our families and our Christian children and wives to come on board. We need them here, but not because we need them, because they need to see them. God's got a plan for them. Deuteronomy 1, 29-31 says, Then I said to you, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God, who is going before you, will fight for you, as He did for you in Egypt, before your very eyes in the desert. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you, as a father carries his son, all the way you went until you reached this place. So in contrast uh, to Saul, again, we see the picture uh, that God gives us of fatherhood, the one who would scoop up a hurting tribe, a hurting people in bondage in Egypt, this passage is talking about. And he would scoop them up and he would carry them to the place where they were okay and safe. And if our Heavenly Father so would do that for us, if He would take us to a safe place, so too, fathers, do we need to provide a safe place for our families? Jesse recognized his son was not safe. And so he instantly chose to give up his own safety to raise to him. By the way, in this passage, if you notice, what was David's first reaction when Jesse and his mom arrive on the scene? I've got to get them to safety. You see, I believe, fathers, if we'll raise our children up, in the way of the Lord, they may not follow in every step. They may not trust in every way. But they have been taught everything that God would have them to be and do. They've been taught. And in time, they will. You've heard my testimony. You know I ran from the Lord for some time. But it was that teachings of my father, my mother, that brought me to the Lord. I could never stop hearing God's call through their love. Never. Don't you give up. But Jesse, uh, he calls our, he comes to his son's aid, and, and instantly David's reaction is, I've got to go see the king of Moab, because I've got to put my father and my mother in a safe place. Now they came down here to protect me, but I am going to be the king, and I need to protect them. So the king of Moab agrees, and that's all we know, that they become safe, and until the time when David is, is yet again the, the not only anointed king, but the in-place king. Let me share with you one more passage of Scripture that tells us that the, the key to effective fatherhood is fellowship of God. In Proverbs 3, verse 11 and 12, it says, My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or, Lothar, uh, uh, or his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. It's important in, in, for us as parents to, to discipline. The purpose of discipline, in a world, by the way, that says that discipline is archaic. Does the world not teach that it's archaic? I still remember in my early years of school uh, getting sent to the principal by the teacher and having the paddle to, to my backside. And I remember one time the principal after paddling me called my mom, who was working in the kitchen of the school there, I believe, and uh, you'll have to verify this mom. But, but he called and said we, 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 he did this, and I had done that, and uh, he, he lied to me, and I, I did lie to him. And, and so I paddled him, and I think my mom said something along the lines of give him another one. Give him <laughs> another one. Don't hold it back. You know, that kind of thing. Is, uh, is missing in our society today. The way our society is teaching our parents to parent, we're just supposed to 
overlook those things because they're what they are. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the healthy father, the father who's leading his children to the Lord, will discipline their kids. They'll discipline them constantly when there needs discipline. And the result will be that it will appear like the relationship that God has with us where the Lord reproves, reproof, right? Proving me or disciplining me. Reproving means to what? Do it again. So this is not the first episode where God was disciplining. This is a continual discipline stage in which I'm learning and being trained to be a God follower. What is wrong with our church today? We're missing between the ages of 18 and 35. That age group is largely misrepresented in the church. Our fathers <coughs> of that age group are missing. Their children are missing. The next generation and the next pastor who's here 20 years from now will be saying what's missing in this church is the ages between 18 and 60 if we do not see God correct the problem in our church. Now I want that to sink in with you a little bit. Generational bondage is what the church is experiencing. Not First Baptist whole. God's church across the world. Evangelical Christian churches. Because our fathers have to lead our home to church. Ruthie will tell you she prayed for years for a husband who would lead his children to church. All those years I wasn't going. She will also tell you, if you ask her, to be specific in your prayer because not only did she get that guy, but she also got him to be the preacher. You know? That's a little bit more than what she was praying for, I think. But in the end, God has a sense of humor. But if you will, ladies, pray for your husband. The husband to be like Jesse. The husband to be like David, who was at this time such a God chaser. <clears throat> a couple of thoughts on Saul, just in closing this first section. Saul became distrustful due to his lack of fellowship with God. For Saul, it was all about holding on to his kingdom. And what he saw was the demise of his kingdom and it being replaced by God's kingdom. Can I just tell you before we read it, at the end of this passage, Saul is so incensed that he sends a few army soldiers up to the temple of Nob and has them kill all the priests just because David got some assistance there. Saul also blames his son, Jonathan, for stirring David up to be against him. So he sees his son as his chief rival. Do you see what an absence of God in the home can do? What happens when God is not present is destruction. What happens when God is present is rebuilding. Resurrection. We are called fathers to lead our children to follow God. Well, the second thing I see Oh, the second point, I want to share with you a couple of things on Saul. Saul became angry with his son over a friendship with David. Instead of looking at the real problem, which was Saul's relationship with God, he chose to turn it outward and be angry at others. Anyone here ever been guilty of doing that? You know what the real issue is, but you get mad at certain things. You, you take it out on, on uh, inanimate objects or, or different things. I am guilty of that. I'm probably not the only one in here, even though I may be the only one to raise my hand. I'm not the only one in here, I'm sure. The, the reality is that we, we have got to be honest with ourselves about our place with God. See, Saul's problem was he thought he was doing everything right. Because he had gotten so distant from God, he couldn't hear from Him anymore. If you're not hearing from God, my first challenge to you as a church is to get back in, in right with God. Don't try to fix the life things until the God thing is fixed. And the life things will never get right if God's not centered in your life. Those 
God is like the foundation that we build everything on. Or that He, if, if I state that correctly, that He builds us on. And the third day I see, Saul became certain that everyone was against him. It was the world. They were all out to get him. He even challenged the Benjamites. You guys knew all about this conspiracy and you did nothing. No one, no one told me that they were all against me. That was his cry. There was nobody against Saul. What happened was God said, Saul, you broke my laws. And for that I have to remove you. And I'm going to put my man in your office. A true king. A king who will follow me. That's where this all began. And it is unraveled because of Saul's disobedience to this point. Well, the last section, verse 9 and beyond, I see that trusting in the Lord is the key to effective fatherhood. Not only fellowship, but we're, we see in churches today people that come to church that call themselves followers of God, but when the, the rubber hits the road, there's no fellowship, there's no trusting, and the fellowship stops. You've seen them come, and, and they'll be here for a period of time, and then you know when, when a tough situation is hit up in their life, boom, poof, they're gone. At the time when they need most to be trusting God, they can't be found. I was that guy. Ruth would talk me into going to church all the early years of our marriage. And I'd go, preach and preach. And it didn't matter what he preached on, he could have preached on the alphabet, letter A. And I would have come to the altar. Because when I got in the presence of God, I recognized my lostness with Him. My separation. I wouldn't want to go back after that. Because I knew if I was here, I'll tell you this now, in hindsight. I don't think I would ever want to admit this during that time. And I didn't want to be here because I knew that if I was here, the conviction would be on me so thick I would have to cut it off. And I just didn't like that feeling. But all those teachings, all that time, trusting the Lord, what, what turned it for me was the loss of a good friend. And my thinking to myself, I have not done enough. I've not done anything. If I were him, where would I be? I turned my life over to the Lord right there in that gymnasium in Germany. My life hadn't been the same since. My trust began for the Lord right then. I mean, it really began as an adult. When you trust God, you will hear His call. You'll answer His <coughs> guidance. You'll understand his teaching. Jesse trusted God, and therefore David did also, right? Jesse trusted him by showing that he was willing to give David up to the kingdom, to, to God's call to be king. He was willing to trust him. He had trusted him in other things, small things. He trusted him in tending the sheep. He had taught him how to give out responsibility. But mostly he taught him to trust God. And David's life showed it. Saul didn't trust the Lord, so he didn't teach trust to his son. So instead of his son coming to him and saying, Hey, Dad, this thing with you and David is not, not right. Jonathan went with David. You see the break in there. You see the break in relationship there. Because of a lack of a trust in God, there was a brokenness in the home. And what has happened in our societies today Men, is that our homes have become broken because of our unwillingness, one, to stand up. But if our home's intact, then the chances are we've not stood up when the homes around us have fallen. And I think we have failed, church, to properly minister to those fathers out there. And but this is Father's Day. So those fathers out there, we've not ministered to them. We're afraid of offending so we don't go, we're afraid of saying the wrong thing. Can I just tell you? I say the wrong thing all the time. So we have to go. Look at the passage in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 32. It says, For the devious are 
an abomination to the Lord, but is intimate, but he is intimate with the upright. So the righteous ones are the ones that God is intimate with. Proverbs 23, 24 says, The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice, and he who sires a wise son will be glad in him. In Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up with the training and instruction of the Lord. Saul did not understand this. And the cost was mighty to him in his home. Look at verse 9. It says, Then Doag, the Edomite, you'll remember Doag. He was the, the war trophy that Saul had left in that temple in Nob. Doag, the Edomite, who was standing by the servants of Saul, says, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to, Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitu. And he inquired of the Lord, and gave him provision, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. And then the king sent someone to summon Ahimelech the priest, and, and a long story short, Ahimelech shows up, <coughs> and he answered this in verse 14. And who among all your servants is faithful as David? Even the king's son-in-law, who is captain over your guard, is honored in your house. So, so he was saying, you know, hey David, he plays hard for you. He's the commander of your armies. What, what's the problem? I thought I was helping one of your people. And Saul had hidden all these things, and all the mistrust of God was causing me a problem. And it ends up costing more than just his direct family. Did I just begin to inquire of God, verse 15, for him today? Far be it from me. Do not let the king input anything to his servant or to any of the household of my father, for your servant knows nothing at all of this whole affair. But the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's household. So there's no reconciliation with Saul. There's, there's no God focus in him. There's no forgiveness in him. He's angry and he's going to strike out. You see the absence of a relationship with God, the absence of fellowship, the absence of trust will clearly set us down the wrong path. And if we continue down that path, then the cost is high. But I tell you today, the Scripture, if you remember what I just read to you in Proverbs, the Scriptures say that, that God honors the upright, that He's intimate with the righteous one. If you walk in the way of the Lord and you trust in the Lord, the Bible says that in your trusting in the Lord and your training those in your home in the Lord, God's going to honor that. He's going to honor it in love. He's going to honor it in every aspect. And what we want to do, church, because I know what you guys are doing, but what we want to do is we want to take that message out there. Do you think God's done with fathers? No. So what's His plan for tomorrow, fathers? To make me a better one? To guide me in raising my children more godly? What about those fathers out there who need to hear this message? Who's going to tell them? Who's going to tell them? Church, we are. We better. We better give them this, this idea, at least. This godly idea. That the godly households come from godly teaching. Even if there's a wayward time in between. God has been taught. Present is there. Verse 16 says, But the king said, You shall surely die. Verse 17 says, And then the king said to the guards who were attending him, Turn around and put the priests of the Lord to death, because their hand also is with David, and because they knew he was fleeing and did not reveal it to me. Servants of the king were not willing to put forth their hands to attack the priests of the Lord. And the king said to Doag, uh, this trophy of war, this guy who he had spared his life, you turn around and attack the priests. And Doag the Edomite turned around and attacked the priests, and he killed that day 85 men who were linen, who wore the linen of an ephah. And he struck down Nob, the city of the priests with the edge of the sword, both men and women and children and infants. Let me tell you why this is so important to this passage. 
when Saul got in trouble the first time, it was because he had broke the law of God. God's law had said to go into the enemy territories and kill every living thing. And by doing so, he would show that God of Israel was the one true God. So there was a ban, if you will, on who could be killed. To take the life of a priest, though, was something that was done only by God. And so when Saul took, gave the order to kill the priest, what he was inevitably doing, and why the Israelite soldiers refused to do it, was Saul was assuming the role of God in his kingdom and in his home. He was saying, I have the power over life and death. I alone. And all the people were taken. And I tell you this. We are not the gods of our home. Church. Man, we're not the gods of our home. There is one true God. He's the God of our home. I want to challenge you today. Can we not be men who lead our home towards God? Can we not be the kind of men who would be affected fathers because of our fellowship of God and our trusting in God? I wrote down some thoughts I had on effective fathers. The effective father would be a true and passionate follower of God. So if you want to know why we would come to the altar today, it's because you recognize fathers or anyone that maybe you have truly been a follower of God. Because that's what the call is today. In this passage, I believe, one of the calls is that we must be a true passionate follower of God. Saul was not, and his life spun out of control. David was. And he was in the middle of where God wanted him. In a stronghold, in a forest. Centered in the center of Judah. His people. They would protect him. And when he was in trouble, they came to him. Family first, and then others. A second thing I see of the effective father will be a trainer to his family in righteousness. Righteousness simply means right standing with God. I want to train my children to be in right standing with God. I don't want them to do that because I'm a pastor. I don't want them to do that because that's what you expect of me. I want them to do that because they love Jesus. That's why I want my kids to be upright, to be righteous in the sight of God. Third thing I see, the effective father will be a receiver of God's mighty and perfect provisions. Do you know what has to happen before I can receive the provisions of God. Before I can receive the provisions of God, I've got to submit everything I own to Him. Because until I can receive His perfect provision, there's no room in my life to receive it unless I've submitted everything I own to Him. One of the problems I see in our society today is that we will say, God, I want you to give me this, this, and this, and this, but I'm not ready to really let you have all this. So I'm going to hold on to that, but, but we're in process. We're in process. And I'm not sure that will work with God. When I say I'm not sure, I'm saying there's no way. I've used the illustration. Uh, Fathers now use this illustration, wives. If your husband came to you and said, hey, I'm going to honor you, I'm going to love you, I'm going to be faithful to you, but I'm really not going to communicate with you. But, but know I'm in process with you. We're in a process, and someday I might be willing to communicate with you, but not right now. Wives, would we willing to accept that? No. Why would we expect God to do any different? Why? But that's exactly what we do. Fathers, let's not do that anymore. We, you and I, we're going to make that decision today. Not do any more. Another thing of effective father will be is a blessed man whose children know the way of the Lord. Notice I said no. There are no grandchildren in heaven. You know what I mean by that? They become responsible for their own actions. But we can raise them up in the Lord. And they will know the Lord. Knowing the Lord is the decision they have to make. But we can raise them up in the Lord. And what the Bible says is when you do that, they will someday return to the Lord. 
promise that we hold on to, Christians, every day of our lives. One last thing I see, the effective father will be a supporter of their family, not just in the good times. Listen, it's easy to go to a park and throw a child up in the air. It's easy to go running through a park. It's easy to go on a boating trip. It's easy to go on vacation. Well, some, <laughs> some vacations are easy. Uh, but it's not as easy to stick when, when the tough times come. And man, God did not call us to be ordinary. He called us to be extraordinary for Him. Whom He calls, He will equip. So if He's called you and your family to a tough time today, let me just say this. David was called into a very tough situation. Jesse has to leave everything behind except the people in his household. And they go there, and then he's moved again to a whole other kingdom. Tough times. Now, I don't know what your tough times are, but I know this. When the Father stands up, steps out towards God, there is no limit to what God can do. So if you'll stand with me, Ken and Pat and Darwin, if you'll come and lead us in a time of leadership, um, I just want to say to you this. Trust God.